This video is part of a self-study course on anti-lock brakes theory and operation. It should be used with the anti-lock brakes theory and operation training reference book. To achieve maximum learning from this self-study course, follow these directions. At the end of each of the four parts, pause the video and answer the review questions. After answering the review questions, read the appropriate section of the anti-lock brakes theory and operation training reference book. This video shows typical anti-lock brake system operation using elements of different ABS systems. The general brakes theory and operation self-study course should be completed before taking this course. I was working the day shift out of headquarters. My assignment was to attend the police driving course. My name is Day, May Day. I carry a badge. Normally, I enjoy attending training classes. Learning stimulates my mind. However, the chief insisted on teaching this class. As an instructor, he leaves something to be desired. The chief was a little upset because the new squad car wouldn't squeal the tires when he slammed on the brakes. He was even more upset that he couldn't spin the tires when he took off from a stop. The chief was sure the car had a brake problem. He said that the pedal pulsated every time he slammed on the brakes and the wheels wouldn't lock up. He said if he couldn't drive like a real cop, he couldn't teach the class. He told me to take the car back to the dealership, find out what's wrong with it, and have a report on his desk by the end of the day. Personally, I think the chief has been watching too much TV, but uh, orders are orders. Driving to the dealership, I hoped my technician friend who taught me about brakes was working today. He has the instincts of a master sleuth, and if anyone could solve this mystery, he could. As I drove along, the word anti-lock appeared on the dash. Another mystery for the tech to solve. When I arrived at the dealership, the tech was waiting for me. It seems that the chief had called ahead. He began his investigation by asking about the chief's concern. I answered as best I could and mentioned the light on the dash. He recommended we go for a road test. Noting the light on the dash, the tech explained the words anti-lock stood for anti-lock brake system, which the new squad car was equipped with. As we drove, he pointed out that the ABS warning light comes on when the key is first turned on to tell the driver that the light is working. However, if the light illuminates after the vehicle is running, it indicates that there is a concern with the anti-lock brake system. Well, that explains the purpose of the light, but the idea of anti-lock brakes intrigued me. I asked him exactly how do anti-lock brakes work. The tech said he could explain it all to me, but since a picture is worth a thousand words, why don't I watch the Ford Anti-Lock Brake System video and study the accompanying training reference book? Deja vu. Well, I made myself comfortable and began my anti-lock brake education. Because of its importance to safety, the brake system is constantly being improved. It has long been known that if the wheels lock during hard braking, vehicle steering control is lost and the car will go into a skid. This is why student drivers are taught to pump the brakes during hard braking on ice and snow. Loss of steering control is a problem on all types of vehicles. Aircraft are very susceptible to loss of control on slippery surfaces due to their high speed at touchdown. This led to the introduction of anti-lock brake systems on aircraft. It took time for technology to advance far enough for ABS to become practical on cars and light trucks. Ford uses many types of anti-lock brake systems. This is because no single system meets the needs of all Ford vehicles. However, all Ford ABS systems work similarly. During normal driving, the majority of vehicle braking requires gradual stops. However, occasionally the driver faces a situation where a panic stop is required. When this occurs, the driver must maintain vehicle control, and ABS can help. Using electrical sensors, ABS constantly monitors the rotation speed of the vehicle's wheels. These sensors send this information to the ABS Electronic Control Unit, or ECU. During hard braking that would ordinarily cause a wheel to lock, 
ABS goes into action. Sensing that a wheel is about to lock up, the ECU sends a signal to the hydraulic control unit, or HCU, which uses hydraulic valves to limit or reduce hydraulic pressure to that wheel. The HCU will modify pressure until the wheel is no longer in danger of lockup. This is a basic explanation of ABS. Section 2 of this video will explain the individual components and their operation in greater detail. Another feature, Traction Assist, uses anti-lock brake system components to limit wheel spin during acceleration. During Traction Assist operation, the ECU monitors wheel rotation speed as the vehicle accelerates. If the ECU detects that a drive wheel has lost traction, it sends signals to the HCU. This activates the electric pump and motor, which generates hydraulic pressure. The HCU sends this pressure to the affected brake calipers, which in turn applies the brakes. This slows wheel rotation, thus helping the tires maintain traction. On some vehicles, the powertrain control module, called the PCM, will reduce engine torque while traction assist is activated. This completes part one of this training video. To help assess your understanding of what you've learned, answer the following review questions. After a question is asked, pause the tape, restart the tape after answering the question, and compare your answer with the correct one. The first review question is, what component sends wheel rotation speed signals to the electronic control unit? The correct answer is that the wheel speed sensor sends the electronic control unit wheel rotation speed signals. If you answer differently, please review part one of this video. Now try another question. What component converts electrical signals from the ECU into hydraulic actions? If you said that the hydraulic control unit converts electrical signals from the ECU into hydraulic action, you are right. Before beginning part two of this video, stop the tape and read lesson one in the Anti-Lock Brakes Theory and Operation Training Reference Book. Now that you have a basic understanding of how ABS works, let's look at the operation of the individual ABS components. Ford Motor Company uses anti-lock brake systems that are manufactured by several different companies. The following components are common to many of these systems. Our first component, the ECU, is a microprocessor that has pre-programmed calibrations to control the anti-lock brake system. Functions of the ECU include calculating wheel speeds, estimating vehicle speed, determining wheel lockup, activating anti-lock brake system, utilizing self-diagnosis and fail-safe systems, storing diagnostic trouble codes in memory. The ECU can be located in the engine compartment, in the passenger compartment, or integral with the HCU. The HCU translates electrical signals from the ECU into hydraulic action. The HCU uses solenoid actuated hydraulic valves to limit or reduce hydraulic pressure to the brake calipers or wheel cylinders when the wheels are decelerating too quickly. During normal braking, ABS performs as a conventional brake system would. The ECU sends no signals to the HCU and the HCU does not interfere with hydraulic pressure flow to the wheels. During anti-lock braking, the ECU senses that a wheel is decelerating too quickly, so it sends electrical signals to the HCU. These signals move the inlet valve, which prevents any further hydraulic pressure from reaching the affected brake. If the wheel continues to decelerate after hydraulic pressure has been interrupted, the ECU will signal the HCU to open the outlet valve. This allows fluid pressure in the brake line to be bled off, reducing pressure to the affected wheel, thus preventing it from decelerating too quickly. 
Once the ECU senses that the wheel is no longer decelerating too quickly, it signals the HCU to close the outlet valve and open the inlet valve. This cycle occurs in a fraction of a second and will repeat as many times as required. If a problem occurs that disables the anti-lock brake system, the vehicle will maintain its conventional braking capability. Typically, some anti-lock brake systems temporarily store brake fluid, which has been bled from the hydraulic system, in an accumulator until it can be returned to the master cylinder. ABS uses at least one electric pump and motor to maintain hydraulic pressure during operation. The pump and motor are typically part of the HCU. When the ECU activates the pump and motor, the driver may feel the brake pedal pulsation. An ABS hydraulic control unit with traction assist uses these same components combined with additional valves to help prevent loss of traction during acceleration. The primary difference is an HCU with traction assist contains isolation valves. When traction assist is required, these valves close, isolating the hydraulic system of the drive wheel brakes. The pump and motor is then activated to provide hydraulic pressure to the drive wheel brakes. As this occurs, the outlet valve modulates hydraulic pressure, providing enough brake action to slow rotation of the wheels without allowing them to stop altogether. While there are differences between HCUs used on various anti-lock brake systems, generally they all operate in a similar manner. Some HCUs cannot be disassembled for service and can only be replaced as assemblies. Others have serviceable components. Always refer to the service manual for the anti-lock brake system you are working on. Now, let's look at the wheel speed sensors and speed sensor rings. The wheel speed sensors are fixed to a location either near the wheel or on the differential housing. The wheel speed sensor rings can be attached to the wheel hubs, the outer CV joints, or on the differential next to the differential ring gear. The wheel speed sensor generates an AC signal as the teeth of the speed sensor ring rotate past it. The ECU uses the signal to calculate wheel rotation speed. This completes part two of this training video. To help you gauge your understanding of anti-lock brake system components, here are two more review questions. The first question is, what two types of valves operate during anti-lock brake operation? And what do they do? During an anti-lock brake stop, the inlet valve and the outlet valve operate. During their operation, they limit or reduce hydraulic pressure to the wheels. If you had a different answer, review part two of this video. The next question is, what components operate together to maintain hydraulic pressure during anti-lock brake operation? The correct answer is that the pump and motor maintain hydraulic pressure during anti-lock brake operation. If you had a different answer, review part two of this training video. Before beginning part three of this video, stop the tape and read lesson two in the Anti-Lock Brakes Theory and Operation Training Reference Book. At this point, I remember that I hadn't had lunch yet, so I walked to the vending machine and bought a candy bar. Since I was up, I walked to the service bay to see if the tech was working on the squad car. I found him working on another car and, being curious by nature, asked him what he was doing. He explained that this vehicle also had an ABS concern that needed investigation. Now that I had an idea how ABS worked, I asked if I could help with the investigation. No problem, he said. Then he asked if I recalled the preliminary checks used when diagnosing a brake concern. Good thing I'd taken notes when I learned about brakes. Reviewing them, I read the steps for diagnosing a customer concern. These included 
verifying the concern, then following diagnostic charts in the service manual. The tech interrupted me. He said that the diagnostic procedures used when working on ABS instruct you to check for diagnostic trouble codes, called DTCs. They're stored in the electronic control unit's memory and can indicate the cause of an ABS malfunction. One method of retrieving codes is to use the Superstar 2. It provides a digital readout of any DTC stored in memory. He explained that a diagnostic trouble code was stored in this ECU's memory. To find the meaning of the code, we looked at the DTC chart in Group 06 of the service manual. Determining that it was a wheel speed sensor DTC, the tech wanted to inspect the sensors and sensor rings before doing any other tests. After removing a hub assembly, we found damaged sensor ring teeth. It looked like a bad case of tooth decay. He explained that because of the damaged teeth, the ECU was receiving bad wheel speed signals. This damage requires replacement of the wheel hub since the speed sensor ring isn't serviceable separately. The part would have to be ordered, so that was all the work we could do on this vehicle. I asked him how he found the problem so fast without calling the psychic hotline. He said the secret to accurately diagnosing automotive systems is to follow a logical diagnostic strategy. When investigating a concern, he uses a strategy called symptom to system to component diagnosis. Well, now, this sounded like a catchy little phrase, I told him, but uh, I thought we were diagnosing a brake system, not writing songs. True, he said. But these words provide him with a logical diagnostic strategy for investigating ABS concerns. He asked me to recall the symptom of the squad car. Well, originally the chief thought there was a brake problem because the tires wouldn't squeal when taking off or stopping. However, I now know that this is the way ABS with traction assist is supposed to operate. But the ABS warning light came on, so that would have to be the symptom. So, ABS warning light on is the symptom. The system that caused the light to come on is the anti-lock brake system. I'm no rocket scientist, but even I could figure that out. The tech then asked what part of the anti-lock brake system could cause the light to come on. Thinking for a second, I realized that since the ECU controls the ABS warning light, the fault would have to be a part of the system that either sends information to or receives orders from the ECU. Good thinking, the tech said. So the system we need to diagnose on the squad car is the ECU and its inputs and outputs. As we walked to the squad car, the tech explained that knowing this, we can focus our investigation on the input and output components. As with the other car, we'll first check to see if any DTCs are stored in memory. Now, different vehicles use different methods to retrieve DTCs. These include using the analog voltmeter, Superstar 2, New Generation Star Tester, and Flash Out on ABS Warning Lamp. Always conduct the investigation by the book using the service manual for the vehicle you're working on. After retrieving the DTCs, we again looked at the DTC charts in Group 06 of the service manual. The tech explained that if more than one DTC is retrieved, diagnose them in the order they appear. We found a code 18 in the ECU's memory. He said to complete this pinpoint test, he would need Bob. I wondered why he needed some guy named Bob. After all, I was standing right there, and anything Bob could do, I could do better. Trying to hide my irritation, I asked, who's Bob? Well, it turns out that Bob is an acronym for breakout box. The tech explained that using Bob enables him to check individual electrical circuits. Using Bob to check electrical circuits is often essential when investigating the cause of an ABS concern, so it seems that knowing Bob can be very useful. While using Bob, the tech followed the electrical schematics in the service manual. He said this helped him to better understand the circuits he was checking. Following the steps in the pinpoint test, the tech found a damaged wire. Reviewing the EVTM electrical schematic, he thought that this wire was likely the cause of the concern. After repairing the wire, we road tested the car to ensure that the repair corrected the concern and cleared the DTC. The methods used to clear DTCs vary between vehicles. Always check the service manual. So, using the symptom 
to system to component diagnostic strategy, we determined that the damaged wire was the component that caused the symptom. This completes part three of this training video. Answer the following review questions, then read lesson three in the ABS training reference book. The first question is, name two methods of retrieving diagnostic trouble codes. Diagnostic trouble codes can be retrieved using an analog voltmeter, Superstar 2, New Generation Star Tester, and Flash Out on ABS Warning Lamp. If you had any two of these methods, you are right. If not, please review Part 3 of this training video. The next review question is, what strategy provides a logical procedure for diagnosing ABS concerns? Symptom to system to component diagnostics provide a logical strategy to help find the cause of a concern. Again, if you had a different answer, review part three of this training video. Now that you have completed this part of the video, stop the tape and read lesson three in the Anti-Lock Brake System Training Reference Book. While the tech was double-checking the wire repair, he noticed that a brake line coming from the HCU had a small leak. Apparently, the tech had not seen the leak during the initial visual inspection. A leak indicates a problem with a brake line or fitting. The tech removed the line from the HCU for closer inspection. During the inspection, he found damage to the line flare. After fabricating a new brake line, the tech installed it on the car. Replacing a brake line means the entire system must be bled. On some systems, air trapped in the HCU can't be bled out unless the valves, pumps, and accumulators operate. Since they only operate during an ABS stop, the HCU must be activated. The tech said that some anti-lock brake systems require special adapters that connect to the breakout box to activate the HCU. However, many vehicles use the new generation star to activate the HCU during bleeding. Following the instructions printed on the adapter, he prepared to bleed the HCU. After installing the adapter to the ECU wiring harness, the tech asked me to turn on the ignition. He then bled the HCU. Using a vacuum bleeder, the tech bled the rest of the brake system. This quickly purged the system of any air. After lowering the car and checking for DTCs, we went for another road test. The road test verified that the brake system worked fine. Upon our return to the dealership, the tech and I went to the service desk to finish up the paperwork. After signing the work order, it was time to go file my report. You can imagine my surprise when the chief walked in the door. He asked if the squad car and I were ready to finish the driving class. I said yes, but the car still wouldn't squeal the tires. The chief said all squad cars should be able to squeal the tires, and there better be a good reason why it wouldn't. Not wanting to get into a battle of wits with an unarmed man, I simply said it'll all be in my report. Good, the chief said. Until then, he'd use the squad car he'd bought that day. This one lets me drive like a real cop. Following the chief to the parking lot, I got a good look at his new squad car. I think the Chief's driving class is going to get very interesting. This completes part four of this training video. Here is a review question to help gauge what you have learned. What special tool may be required to bleed the hydraulic control unit? To bleed the HCU, use the anti-lock test adapter to purge any air trapped in the valves, pumps, and accumulator. Consult the service manual for the proper procedure. If you had a different answer, review part four of this training video. This completes the anti-lock brake system training video. We hope it will help you to better understand, diagnose, and repair Ford and Lincoln Mercury anti-lock brake systems. 
Now, read lesson four in the Anti-Lock Brake System's Theory and Operation Training Reference Book. Thank you.